Well, good morning. Ooh, thank you for that warm welcome. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I have a very important and exciting topic to share a few moments with you. My topic this morning is something that I know that many of you, you train on and you, you're concerned about and you care about. My topic this morning is sexual harassment. And I know that most of you are like I am. There are things that you're interested in that your organization needs. You need to talk about change. You need to talk about leadership. But I know the one thing that gets your team members and you yourself excited is when you find out that the mandatory sexual harassment training has been scheduled and is coming up. Yes. I know, I know. One of the things that I do, that I'm fortunate enough to do, is I travel all over the country. Now, I'm very happy when I get to work in Texas, because I live in Austin, Texas, but I'm all over the country. This week alone, I've worked in Washington, D.C., I worked in Chicago yesterday, and then I'm here with you today. And sexual harassment is one of my most favorite topics to deal with. One of the reasons I love sexual harassment is the enthusiastic response that most of your team members, and they meet me with in the morning when I start off our mandatory training sessions. In fact, most of the time when I do sexual harassment, team members will walk into the training room and they'll walk in and they'll sit all the way at the back of the room and they'll look at me like this. Sexual harassment training. <laughs> Is this going to be hands-on? <laughs> I either see a whole bunch of unhappy faces coming to my mandatory training sessions, or I get a lot of people that think that our topic of sexual harassment training, they think it's a big joke. Part of me is thrilled at that response. Because, see, currently what I do is I go out and I train with your organization. I help you learn what sexual harassment really is. I help you answer some of the myths of sexual harassment. For instance, I commonly hear in the training classes, someone will say, sexual harassment law. This is the government telling us we can't make jokes at work. This is the government saying you can't look at somebody. This is the government trying to stop love with love. That's what people tell me. The myths are out there. And I go out and I train and I work with your organizations to answer those questions and to teach people that sexual harassment is a real important topic that can be prevented. But part of me when I meet people who don't take our topic seriously or who are not paying attention in my classes, part of me, the lawyer part of me, is a little happy. Because I will tell you that currently, I'm all about being proactive and helping your organization prevent lawsuits, use the management skills that you need to to make it a higher productivity work environment, to make people have a better teamwork atmosphere. And that's what I do now. But see, in the past, not that long ago, what I used to do is practice law in Austin full time. And what I had happen on a couple of occasions is people came to my law office and told me horrible stories about things that had happened to them at work. I had one instance where a person told me that they had gone on a business retreat with their company, and their supervisor had had a lot of drinks at dinner at night. And the supervisor ended up naked and drunk in a hot tub and allegedly did some inappropriate things to the person they supervised. And when I had people come into my law office and tell me these types of stories, on many, many days, I would take these cases. <laughs> and when I took these cases, what did I do? I filed lawsuits against the people, the companies, that had these inappropriate sexual harassment behaviors occurring. And on many happy, happy lawyer days in the past, Companies had to write what? Big checks. Big checks. That made my clients very happy and made me 
very happy for a couple of days. So here's what I'm trying to get across about sexual harassment. I have a couple things I want to share with you. At a bare minimum, I'd like you to remember. First of all, sexual harassment training, the training that you do at your company, is that actually mandatory and required that you do that every year? Or is that something that's just optional? What's the answer? Oh, thank you. The answer is that the sexual harassment training is actually mandatory. In fact, the federal government has made a little rule that I'll just remind you about. If you do not have your annual ongoing sexual harassment training with a qualified trainer where you document and make everybody sign in, the sign-in sheet that they attended, if your company fails to train on sexual harassment, then the consequence is this. When your company does get sued, then what your company's punishment will be for not doing the training, it's something that lawyers in the legal system call punitive damages. Punitive damages. Oh, my goodness. It's making me happy just to think about it. Punitive damages. Is this a good thing for your company to have to pay? No, and let's just make it clear what punitive damage is. It's kind of a legal term. Let's make it clear what that means in English. What does the word punitive mean? Punishment. And the word damages is a legal word that just simply means money. So punitive damages is punishment money that your organization is going to have to pay to punish you for failing to train on these topics. So first, it's mandatory. Secondly, when you have the mandatory training, it has got to be effective. If you show your team a sexual harassment video that each and every single one of them sleeps through, is that effective? No. I show up to do my training many times, and I get there, and the company says, oh, we do this all the time. Our people, they have training every single year. So I get into the training session, I start asking questions to people. I ask people, I say, what does quid pro quo mean? And their eyes glaze over. I ask them, what's the name of the sexual harassment law? And they look at me and say, I don't know, I have no idea. If you are having the training, it needs to be effective. People need to learn something in it. And they should, at a minimum, be able to tell you at least what sexual harassment is and what the types are. And there's only two things, two types, that they need to learn. So the training needs to be effective. I make the training as effective as possible. I do a couple of things to make my training sessions very pertinent, effective, and enjoyable. First of all, I, in my former life, used to be a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I used to teach business law in the business school. And I, used a t I learned a technique, I developed a technique teaching at UT that I use in my training sessions from the very beginning of the session to ensure that it's going to be effective and useful and not be a waste of anybody's time. When I used to teach my business law classes, even though the majority of my students are just like you. The majority of my students were so excited and thrilled to be in business law that they came to class excited, took notes, and participated. But I had a little group of people that would come to my classes. And sometimes they'll try to come to your training class. I had a little group of people that would come to class, and this will be shocking for you to hear, but they would actually try and sometimes succeed in falling asleep in my business law class. Now I know you're thinking, how, how could they do that? I don't know. So I developed the technique that I use when I train. If at any point with your group, and I will warn them about this in the beginning, if at any point in the time of our training, I look out in the training room and I see that I have lost someone, by meaning that I've lost them, I mean I look in their direction and the participants, their eyes are closed and their head is to the back or to the side or down. And they're making noises like they're snoring. <laughs> if that happens, I have lost them. And then our mission to prevent punitive damages and to make the training effective, we can't accomplish it. 
So what I did as a professor and what I do as a trainer, and I warned your group early, and it seems to be effective, is I warn them. I say, if I lose any of you at any time, I say, I will simply move closer to whomever it is in the room that I have lost. And then what I will do is I can and I will become louder and more animated in very close proximity to whomever it is I have lost in my mission to bring them back. That seems to work. And then I'll be honest, it's adult training, so I, I give them an out. I share with your group. I tell them if they cannot, if at some point throughout our day, especially after lunch, they find they cannot stay awake, I tell them it's okay if they will simply fake it. If they'll keep their eyes open during the training, and if every once in a while they glance past me, the front of the room, it looks like they're awake, and that's good enough. The training has to be effective. People have got to wake up and stay awake, and you have got to relate sexual harassment to their jobs. You have got to relate sexual harassment to their paycheck, to their behavior. Now, we have different training that we do for managers and supervisors because your managers and supervisors have heightened responsibility, and your company, your organization, is 100% absolutely liable for the sexual harassment behavior of your supervisors, whether your company knew about it or not. So your managers are going to have a little bit specialized training. We're going to talk to them. I have some issues with managers most recently in sexual harassment training. It seems to be a challenge. So I've had to go and do some re-emphasis. That's a managers recently that seem to have a challenge in the work environment with keeping all of their clothes on all day long while at work. I, I know it sounds simple. You would think they should know that. But I've had some recent instances. I've also had to have some recent instances where we need to reemphasize for management that they are managers all of the time. Does that include something like a company holiday party? Yes, it does. Does that include a business trip? Yes, it does. So we've had to clarify that for your team members and your managers to make them understand those count also. And the rules apply, and we need to keep our clothes on. I also, for your non-supervisors, am going to do sexual harassment training that is going to, in addition to teaching them the rules, making it interesting and applicable, we're going to empower them to speak up. We have got to have your team members tell supervisors and tell human resources when someone says or does something that makes them feel uncomfortable. We've got to empower them to let you know so you can resolve the issue at the organization and they don't go out and talk to those lawyers out there. We don't want that. But I know, and sometimes I'll talk about, I know how hard it is for people to speak up about issues like sexual harassment. In my own personal experience, I've had lots of jobs while I was going through school. And I had a job one time here in the state of Texas where I worked for our state comptroller. That's a state agency, our state comptroller. And I had a job where I was an administrative technician. I was an admin tech, sort of a receptionist clerical position. And I got this job, I was very young, I was in my early, early 20s, and I was so excited when I got my job as an admin technician at this place because it was a wonderful opportunity for me. And the job I had previously held before this job was I had spent a couple of uh, years as a professional phone psychic for the Psychic Friends Network. True, true. So I got my new professional job, and as I was an administrative technician. And my job required a lot of filing. I had to file things in file cabinets. This job required me to bend down a lot, open up file cabinets, and file things. That was my job. I noticed the very first day of work that there was an older gentleman that worked there, a very powerful um, manager at the agency. And I noticed that every time that I would bend down to file something in the file cabinet, that this gentleman would sort of come from out of nowhere and kind of run and stand behind me very closely. And he would say things like, you look very nice today, and sort of rub my back. You look very nice today. 
And so what I started to do was every time, every time my supervisor said, Courtney, you got to file something, and that's part of my job, I'd take the file and I'd look around. I'd look down the hallway. I'd look behind me. Who was I looking for? That man. I was looking to see if he was anywhere around. And as soon as I'd look around, I'd say to myself, well, coast is clear. I don't see him anywhere. It should be all right. I would bend down to file. And what would happen? There he was. I don't know how he moves so fast. Like lightning. He would show up and he'd stand there. You look so nice today. Rub my back. How did this make me feel? Yeah, pretty bad. Because I, to clarify for those of you, I did not want him <laughs> to come up behind me and stand and say, you look so nice today, and rub my back. Made me feel bad. Should I have said something to my supervisor or to human resources? Yeah, I should have. But let's be honest, my training is always based in real life. I'm a very pragmatic person. I did not say anything to anybody. Because I said to myself, I said, well, I'm an admin tech. <laughs> I'm nobody. This guy is a senior manager. I said, if I say something, they're probably going to say that I'm rocking the boat. I might get in trouble. Maybe they'll fire me for bringing up this. I said, they're not going to believe me. So I said and did absolutely nothing. The fact that I said and did absolutely nothing, what did that guarantee would continue? the behavior and it doesn't just continue it always is going to escalate so he we went from standing behind me very closely you look so nice today to rubbing my back to trying to touch my behind and making more and more graphic comments i understand why your team members don't speak up but here's what you need to know when they refuse to tell you what's happening that little problem that you could have resolved with good management policy turns into a big problem, and then by the time they do tell somebody it's so severe, your company's in, in huge trouble. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those managers aside, we're going to teach them what they need to know in a real pragmatic way and explain to them the consequences of their behavior. And for your non-supervisors, we're going to explain their rights and we're going to empower them so they don't do what I did. And so they speak up in a way that's effective and that you can create a high-performance work environment where you take sexual harassment seriously. And I'll just tell you now, sexual harassment, my training, it's not hands-on. And sexual harassment training is not the government trying to stop love. We'll clarify that later. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I sincerely appreciate it. Y'all have a great weekend.